Uh, the next talk will be by my colleague, Mr. V. S. Chandrasekhar. Uh, he's an expert. He's an expert on simulation technologies. He's an electronics engineer from Mysore University. He has been the project director for many of the manned aircraft simulator programs. And uh, recently, as the trend go, he is also turned to unmanned aerial vehicle side. So he has started developing a simulator for UAVs. So he has made a developed uh, Rustum 1 UAV simulator. In addition to that, he has made the, he has been a project director for the simulator for LCA training, uh, LCA engineering simulator, and other uh, earlier programs. For the last three or four years, he is heading the micro UAV program in ADE, and he is the convener of the national program on micro air vehicles. So today's talk is about the micro air vehicle program in ADE as well as the initiative it is being taken up uh, for the initial program on micro air vehicles and uh, it is going we look forward to a very good talk on this chairman uh, the fellow speakers and Ag agas audience is present here uh, a very good morning to one and all and it's a great privilege as well as honor to be here on this occasion and i thank the organizer for giving me the chance before starting my presentation on the micro air vehicle development at ADE, let me play a small video clip. I have framed my presentation as follows. Uh, in the beginning, I'll just give a brief on the ADE scenario, or what are the type of uh, UAVs that at ADE we are working on, and immediately move on to the micro air vehicle project. In this class, we've got two class of vehicles. One is really a micro air vehicle, which is sub kg class vehicle, followed by a mini air vehicle, or called mini UAV, which is about two kg class of vehicle. And my presentation, the red one, I'll be addressing a little bit on the Indian scenario on the development of micro air and mini air vehicles. And of course, the knowledge medicine that to be followed. And uh, this is the scenario on the, as far as AD is concerned in terms of unmanned aerial systems. And uh, these are the big, big vehicles. I've been hearing about the big vehicles for a long time. And uh, of course, yesterday we had a presentation by my colleague on these vehicles. And I'm going to concentrate purely on the micro air vehicles and the mini air vehicles. 
course, I would like to say this uh, very to start with, of course, it's a joint uh, program project with, with NAL, National Aerospace Laboratory, Bangalore, where we jointly developed the 300 class of fixed wing vehicle as well as the 2 kg vehicle. Uh, it's only because uh, we are busy with many bigger projects, we had to use minimum resources and also use the make use of expertise available in other labs. This is why we went for a joint project, joint development project. And of course, the various applications are, of course, you can see there are a lot of applications, disaster management, commercial applications, and also for the research and development, where you can develop many of the algorithms. And this is an ideal test bed, test all your algorithms under any technology. Because the collateral damage is minimum, and you can, the cost is not very high. And also comes the defense, there are certainly many, many applications including the recent problems which raised because of low intensity conflict, insurgency, and counterterrorism. As I said, this is a responsibility shared between ADE and NAL as far as this project is concerned. And uh, to start with, of course, three years back when we started this project, there was no any requirement from any of our users to start with because no one ever believed that a micro -air vehicle of this class can do any useful machines. Uh, maybe at the end of my talk, probably you'll all be able to answer whether it can do some machines or not. And uh, we never had any of the specifications laid down because there's no requirement from the user. So we, we looked at various uh, projects elsewhere in the world, looked at what DARPA defines for micro air vehicles, and came out with our own uh, basic requirements as far as the vehicle is concerned, which can have a size of 300 millimeters and a weight of 300 grams. So DARPA design, though DARPA says 150 millimeter or 150 grams of vehicle is an ideal case for a micro air vehicle. Since we had to start for the first time, we thought we can do a 300 mm vehicle and then migrate to a smaller vehicle. Of course, so these are some of the requirements which we specified ourselves, which can have an endurance of about 30 minutes and fly about 100 meters above the ground level. And uh, we also, after a lot of deliberations, went for a brushless DC motor based electric uh, motor. And of course, the most important thing is the flight control. Uh, this is where a lot of effort has gone into it. We wanted to develop a, an autonomous, fully autonomous air vehicle so that the effort from the person who's using it is minimum. Of course, we also had the portable ground station followed with the data link for all this for the smaller size. And this you must have seen a huge ground station, huge data link for a long endurance, uh, bigger vehicles. And everything is small in scale. Of course, the technology still remains the same, probably more complex in some of these areas. Of course, we have to do because the quality of the video come out with the small miniature cameras are not good enough. We got to do some of the enhancements of the images real time in real time so that some meaningful intelligent information is available to the ground personnel. A typical machine is shown over here. It could be many more machines like waypoint navigation. This is basically over the kind of an application where you have the range over here, you can go up to your face and then probably loiter in that place and then come back. Yeah, uh, let me start even uh, in the beginning. In fact, I had to put this slide when I went for a presentation in my, to one of the air esteemed users. This is the first slide I put. The first slide because they all believe that, okay, these microwave vehicles are nothing but toys. A lot of hobbies fly this and how it is different from what we are developing. So I had to convince them first why we started this work. So these are the reasons, suppose, because you had to have a high level of the skills to fly a remotely controlled uh, aero model kind of a vehicle. And one more thing is, the, the remotely controlled aero model vehicles are one order of magnitude larger than what we are talking about today, that's the 300 millimeter class vehicle. And also the levels, skill levels are required, or the skill levels required for flight is very high, but you can't give a soldier a vehicle and ask him to get trained on how to fly this. And of course you don't have a waypoint navigation, and you don't have a literally a data link and a payload. Once you add all those things, the cost goes up. Second thing, you don't get telemetry data, and most, even if you have a telemetry data, small data or a video, they all operate in the ISM band. That's the wireless LAN band, which is not permissible to be used in the, on fo of the uh, uh, forward areas like in the army and other places. And of course, other thing is uh, rugged construction is not there. We make a very toy-like stuff most of these, and they can't be really used in a, a operationally deployable areas like uh, terrorism plays and then the forward areas where uh, weather conditions are adverse, and we've got to have a rugged system. And of course, you don't have the real-time image exploitation to get any meaningful output, even if the camera is on board. And uh, most of these cases, the endurance or levels are very low. You don't, you can't play even beyond 15 minutes. And then 15 minutes, you really can't do any useful machines. And uh, having said that, vehicle being very small, it doesn't mean the technologies are uh, 
simpler. All technologies are there. If you look at every tech, every technology is required for developing an air vehicle is available, is, as, is required for this. And we went in the conventional way. We had the, all, all, the, all the systems, all the technologies required for developing air vehicle are there in this block. We can see we have the internal testing, airframe design, we have the propeller development, composite fabrication, and also a simulation facility, CFD studies, we also have the data link and the portable GCS with a very, very micro payload and an image processing. The entire gamut of technologies are required to make a, a meaningful, mission oriented micro air vehicle. As we started for the first time, we really looked at the multiple options. We didn't have, we didn't know how to start actually. So we said, okay, let us do multiple designs. We wanted to go to start with have some pre-conceptual design to have to have two of them as a fallback option. And of course, we did the initial design based on the historical data. When we started that, we looked at the other uh, contemporary maybe flying elsewhere, and we took those data and we wanted to base our design based on these parameters. And also use some of the open source aero prediction tools to initially configure the airframe and also uh, did the air, uh, wind tunnel model and then tested in the wind tunnel and cross validated the CFD tools. And of course, we went for the commercially available propulsion system with the matching uh, propeller, DC motor based uh, uh, propulsion system with the matching propeller. Of course, we also did the structure analysis, fabricate the vehicle, and we did flight in the RC mode to start with. Of course, now we have to add autonomous uh, pilot to the vehicle. We did look at the evaluation of very, very autonomous autopilots. Of course, we also looked at the imported autopilots like Micropilot, Kestrel, and all. And we did fly a few of initial flights using these autopilots. Of course, we also taken up uh, autopilots indigenously as well as in-house. Today, we got at least three to four uh, uh, autopilots available in the country, all indigenously developed performing as good as even better in some areas compared to the ones available in the market. And also we signed some OUs with these uh, vendors to get the autopilot done. And we also developed in-house the three-axis motion simulator so that we can evaluate the autopilot and then put it on the closed loop simulation like we've used in a similar pilot in the loop simulation. So we had this hardware the loop simulation facility available, developed the data links on the single axis tracker, uh, basically to track the MVV and get a good video and also develop many of the algorithms required purely for the surveillance point in view, point of view, and integrate all the systems on the MAV and carry the flight test in the autonomous mode. Now these are the three vehicles which uh, we developed, and uh, I'll, I'll come to this slightly, the details slightly later. And basically they're all, one is that rectangular plate with, with a little camber, and these two are the volumetric, uh, volumetric wings, and a little more details on the uh, type of airfoil and the platform I'll be discussing slightly later. Even though we selected three concepts, if you look at it because of the quick turnaround time to, to start designing the fly, we did try out many of each of these categories. We had the multiple variations in terms of material use, the camber, and to see which one performs efficiently. Similarly, for the other vehicle called Golden Hawk, also we had the multiple configurations. We had a double fin and a single fin. We wanted to see which one gives a better lateral stability you know, in terms of performance. We also had a pusher configuration where we had the propeller in the back, it has its own advantages, we will discuss it slightly later. In fact, after flying these vehicles, we did compare these vehicles with what is available elsewhere in the world. And we can look at these vehicles, all the three, compare favorably with all the vehicles, and we had a sustained uh, endurance of 30 minutes and a clear cut range of two kilometers. So design methodology is again same, uh, this is basically to ensure a rapid prototyping. What we did is initially we know the what weight class we're looking at and we know what sizing we have to work with and we did the airfoil selection, platform selection, structure analysis were done and then quickly. One is structure analysis to get the composite uh, airframe for a uh, more reliable performance. But to try initially, we did make prototypes using the foam and balsa wood and we, we did fly it in the RC mode to ensure that aerodynamic characteristics are met, the performance, aer aerodynamic performance and efficiencies are met and later on we did the fabrication and and did fly with the RC mode before even venturing onto auto autonomous mode. Again, to start with, uh, the, all the airfoils, uh, whatever the airfoils available in the open literature, we've been selected, and for various configurations. We also looked at the battery, battery LD performance for a, a plus 61, but it has a negative pitching moment. 
So what we did is we modified this uh, flutter 61. We get a better performance in terms, we retain the CL by CD slope at the same time, making this same noise, uh, the pitching moment slightly positive. Looking at this is again the platforms, these are all available. What platform do they use? So ultimately the design is an intuition and we have a comb combination of airfoils and a platform to select with. You got to play around and then make the design and see which one performs better. Obviously you can't have all the choices. We can't go at uh, all the choices, the combinations are very high. Uh, so that extent, some of this intuition has been used to ensure that the system performs the way we want it to perform and view the performance requirement. As I said, design is a compromise and is an intuition. And we have the various types of uh, aircraft to be looked at to start with. And of course the conventional ones and the biplanes, we didn't consider because of the low aspect ratio of this kind of a vehicle where we had to keep the span around 300 to 350 millimeter. And uh, we had to still have a larger wing to get the lift. So the flying wing was the most uh, obvious choice. And this is what you can see most of the navies do fly the flying wing. In that we had of course multiple cambered plate, blanket wing and the pusher configuration. Each has its own advantage and disadvantages as I put it here. Of course uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, this, this actually had a larger fuselage guard, whereas uh, volumetric airfoils provide you enough space for providing you the electron, onboard electronics, whereas we had a problem in the Campbell plate. Of course, in the Campbell plate, another problem was it was very difficult to use the CFD for uh, any cross validation. The thickness of the rectangle plate we selected was about 3 millimeters. We really had lots of problem in CFD analysis, though we did a lot of studies in the wind tunnel experiment. Of course, as I said, these small vehicles are a lot of design issues because they're all lower NOS number vehicles. Stability and control is the issue. Low wing loading again. And of course, high CL, high CL slope, of course, gives you better lift, but less tolerant to gusts. And the structural weight is also low structural weight, the hard and controls. And if you have a low stall velocity, that means you can fly the area to low velocity. Extremely, extremely good as far as imaging is concerned, but stability is poor in that. Of course, the advantages we're gaining over a period of time is we have an onboard uh, small process, mini processors in terms of FPGAs to which could be exploited and today we have a very powerful onboard processor to do a lot of tasks, autonomous mode for autopilot as well as for the vision processing which I would cover later on in my presentation. As I said again the wind tunnel available in NAIL was made use of. We had a low velocity, low turbulence wind tunnel. We did the studies in the wind tunnel and uh, we can see the, we also developed a small uh, uh, Six component force balance, you can see from here. Six component force balance, which is a one kg payload, and it has a resolution of one gram. You can go as low as one gram as far as the force balance is concerned. This is specifically developed for this class of vehicles. We also did the well, CFD studies on this for various angle of attack. We can see the pressure distribution, both and the streamline distribution over the wing as well as the water city problems at the tip. And similarly, we also went for a structural uh, evaluation. Uh, if you look at these vehicles, you have a ridge in the end. We wanted to keep, uh, this is for a black tip where we wanted to have a, a flexible in the center and have a rigid uh, uh, in the edges. So this will have a very good, uh, uh, this thing uh, for a cross gust wind, it's very good because of flexibility in the center, also lightweight. So the propulsion is concerned, we did a lot of tests with the various combination of commercially available motors and the propellers. We did a static testing to get the strain and then map it onto the thrust. And also we did the dynamic testing in the wind tunnel. So we were able to get both the cruise thrust and the static thrust requirements for the air vehicle. These are the pl plots for the various propellers we have selected. Now coming to the autopilot uh, development, as I said that we evaluated many of the cost autopilot available. We did have many flights using this commercially available autopilot. And we also developed indigenous autopilot with uh, local vendors. We also have an indoor in-house development where we use embedded system controller based uh, autopilot. I'll show you uh, in my couple of slides later the autopilot which we have developed in-house. Now the simulation, of course, that's, uh, that's my area. And uh, we did the trade off simulation offline in Mac Lab, the longitudinal axis. You can try the same thing in the real time simulator available for the UAV simulator at ADE. Then on to the lateral side, we did the six off simulation. 
I did the, put it on the real time simulation. We also developed the three axis motion simulator and made the hardware in the loop simulation for the entire thing that we had the processor in the loop and the three axis motion simulator mimics the air vehicle itself as far as the attitudes are concerned and developed the single axis tracker as the portable GPS and we bought this digital link which is in the non ISM band and integrate all the subsystems from the MAV and carried out the flight testing. Mr. Shekhar, can you complete okay. in five minutes? Okay. This is autopilot, we say that it's a micropilot from this one and this is what we developed in our, we can look at the comparison in terms of weight and the performance, these are all very weight like low weight, 10 grams, so 20 grams autopilot, do this weight 28 grams. And as I said that this is the hills facility we have set up at ADG, we have a ground control station, portable ground control station which is integrated to simulator and to the three axis motion simulator. This is the portable GCS we developed at ADE. As I said, the rugged, rugged construction is very important, it's very robust, it can be used in very harsh environment. And this is the typical ground, ground control station page where you have the imagery where you are flying, area of interest, and also we have the spots of the air vehicle. And similarly, we have the data link. The command goes from the GCS to the tracker to the vehicle, and then the dots and the up, uh, up, up, up link is in the USF band, and the down link is in the S band. We have the video as well as uh, the telemetry data coming through the tracker to the GCS. And of course, the tracker is uh, uh, using the GCS coordinates given by the vehicle, and that's given back as a command to the tracker from the GCS. This is a typical image processing uh, for a surveillance. We're not looking at the vision based navigation at all. We are looking for a conventional uh, navigation using IMS sensor. Whereas this is used basically for the surveillance, where we had the image announcement. Uh, and then, of course, mosaicing and video stabilization on the ground. All these things are shown in the video which I presented at the beginning. And this is a typical navigation page for a vehicle uh, when it's on flight. And a little more on the waypoint navigation here. Uh, this is the photos taken for the actual flight. You can see the size of the vehicle compared to the Eagle. Of course, we also did several R&D. Being a science and technology project, we had to take a lot of uh, R&D initiatives for the future applications. And uh, also, we had uh, taken some of them on the vision based navigation, vision air navigation, and something on optical avoidance using optic flow and other, other things. And something on the aerodynamics, the lower aeronaut studies on the lower aeronaut, lower aeronaut number aerodynamics airfoil, and uh, many of the studies on, of course, flexible wing and control surfaces, mapping. All these projects have been taken, and most of them have been completed to meet the future requirements. And many of the design facilities have been set up here, and we also is now going to set up an indoor test facility as shown yesterday by Professor Jonathan Howe where you can have a motion sensor without using IV, you'll be able to get the position, accurate position, say very high accurate, both the six, six, three uh, linear and three uh, attitudes you can get in when it is being sensed. And coming to uh, next 2kg, we, we have done again a 2kg. This was actually basically required for a low intensity conflict kind of an application, which does slightly uh, better performance in terms of endurance, in terms of uh, ceiling, in terms of a uh, better payload. The mostly, the most important criteria here is Fully autonomous, carries a better payload, gives you a better picture. This is a project which is taken up very recently. We already have many, many flights. We're now trying with autonomous flight. Of course, development cycle remains the same. And uh, this is a typical study of the CFD for both the vehicles and also for the structural uh, uh, design of the wings. And the payloads, basically. We have the Sony and as well as this is a daylight camera. And this is a, re this is a recent one. It is a, just now you can see this product is now available in Aero India. This is from Night Vision, Next Vision Microcam D gyro stabilized payload. At 100 grams, you get an IMU based uh, camera for a daylight. It's also developing one for a, a thermal camera of similar weight, slightly higher weight class. This is going to be provide a very good uh, gyro stabilized. You don't have to do a stabilization on ground. And as I said, that the various IR cameras have been tested, starting from 26 grams from Thermotechnics. The advantage here is we, we had a, uh, we, we, we tried to have a movie with uh, Thermotechnics where they're going to give us a PAL resolution. Uh, based uh, IR cameras. Of course, this is the one which is the re most recent and most important uh, sensor called uh, uh, acoustic vector sensor. Of course, I'm not going to talk much details on that because the next speaker is going to talk explicitly on the acoustic sensor. So I'm not going to get onto that right now. But what I wanted to say is the very concept of having the 2 kg vehicle used to have a special payload called acoustic vector sensor, which is going to give a lack long of a gunfire point, which is very, very critical in the urban, I mean, the terrorism kind of an application where we have to locate the source of the noise coming from. 
for that we have built a, a controller where you can record this acoustic noise eight channel on on board and uh, we are venturing into more complex uh, hardware hardware on board which also does does for autopilot vision as well as acoustic we got a very complex system everything is on board the whole weight of this will be about 120 grams the design is complete the fabrication is going on right now so as i said this is the last uh, slide which i like to put where uh, uh, sir lord um, where the where we stand nationally so we have drd one cs are joint working jointly working for this project and we have a national program on micro air vehicle in this of course stakeholders are we have many stakeholders said in nail all the iits education institutes one national design and the research forum which is a consortium of many private industries as well as academic institutes the objective is to develop all classes of vehicles six spring tractors rotary wing entomopters and ultimately the goal is to go for a insect based vehicles this is what even air forum in united states have put up in 2030 they have a vision statement which says that they have to fly indoor and in insect class of vehicle because the flappers the bird flappers will be of not much of a use and though it's very complex in technology <coughs> and also we have a locally sigma the department of science and technology and many projects sponsored by air forum in the indian institute academic institute and also private in industries also working on the micro air vehicles and this this are going about uh, this how the where all the technologies have been covered in the national program you can see this and we can also look at the 22 million dollars us dollars how the money is split as far as the various uh, uh, research development and human resources are concerned and the final team acknowledgement for due to drdo for sponsoring this project dsp also to sponsor jointly with drdo for the national program micro air vehicle nail for partnering us for developing this activity thank you very much thank you chandrasekhar i think uh, micro uv work is something like putting an elephant into a pot i think uh, like a project which is handling which is very extremely technically difficult he managed the difficult task of comparing so much of information in just 25 minutes thanks a lot for your effort sir